The question I ask myself more than any other is, what are we looking at here? What is this thing that people are calling, well, in this case, a climate crisis? Well, it's one aspect of a much bigger crisis. We have this tendency, I mean, it's a survival strategy, really, to divide the world up into categories that we can understand. And so we say, right, this is a climate crisis. Oh, look, and there's a biodiversity crisis. Oh, and we've got a pollution crisis. And we've got a soils crisis. And we've got a freshwater crisis. And lots of other crises, some of which we don't talk about at all. But we divide them into these categories, not because they are naturally divided into these categories, but because our brain has to cope with them. We have to be able to understand them. And so we chop the issues up into these boxes so that we can grasp them and, and, and see, see what's happening within each box. But of course, that's not how it works in reality, in nature. Nature has no boxes. The systems that we divide up to make our brains understand them are all intermingled. They're all tangled up together. As John Muir said, if you try to pick out anything by itself, you find it hooked to everything else in the universe. And so one of the problems we face in having summits about climate or summits about biodiversity or summits about pollution, if indeed they do, is, is that in trying to address one problem or one aspect of the problem, we can actually exacerbate others because we're not seeing the big picture. So a classic example of this is that one proposal is that we build literally millions of direct air capture machines, great big confections of steel and concrete, which will suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then pipe it away to be buried in geological formations. Now, we can argue about whether or not that's inherently a good or bad thing. And, you know, there's some arguments in favour. But looking at it in isolation, we could miss the fact that these require a huge amount of resources. Masses more steel, masses more concrete. So if we take just one aspect of, of that construction demand, sand. Now, this is an issue which people seldom talk about. It seldom features in international discussions, but it turns out to be huge because the demand for sand, for construction, mostly to put into concrete, turns out to be a huge driver of ecological destruction and wildlife loss. And the reason for that is that there's only particular kinds of sand which are suitable for construction. You can't use the sand in the Sahara because it's this, the grains apparently aren't the right shape to stick the concrete together properly. What people want more than anything is river sand, followed by marine sand as a, as a second best choice. And so people are literally stealing riverbeds and stealing beaches. There's a huge issue around the world of sand piracy, believe it or not, with the massive theft of of entire beds of rivers and lakes and, and whole beaches just being taken away in the night to be turned into construction. And so we say, right, we're going to solve climate with direct air capture machines. But if we're not looking at the whole picture, we're going to be exacerbating a whole other issue because we're not thinking about it, because we're not seeing it as part of the whole. Now, I recognise that you know our brains have constraints. We one of the tragedies of our situation is that the systems we're engaging with are far bigger and more complex than, than, than human understanding can grasp. And so we're constantly just looking at small parts of the picture and trying to extrapolate from that. But a fundamental principle of environmental thought is holistic thinking, is to try to see the picture in as wide terms as possible so that we don't blunder into one crisis when we're trying to solve another. And in fact, you know, when you look at these crises, you see that it's really hard to discern where the dividing lines lie, except for the really artificial divisions that we create. So, for example, if you look at what's happening to the, 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 the North Atlantic right whale, now, this is a whale which was greatly depleted by whaling, but began to recover um, and seemed to be on track to getting back to a fairly healthy population size. But then 
its population began to crash again, and now it's down to just 95 breeding females, which is a catastrophic state for any population. In fact, it could already, in functional terms, be extinct. In other words, it could be too late for this wonderful, magnificent species. As a result of um, the, 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 the low numbers that it's already reached. But why? What, why has its population begun to decline? Well, one immediate reason is that it's been moving north um, uh, along the Atlantic seaboard of North America and coming into contact with shipping lanes, with very busy waters, and a huge number of whales have been killed or maimed by being hit by ships and torn up by their propellers. It's extremely distressing. Um, they've also, as a result of moving up through those waters, become entangled in fishing gear, particularly the ropes used to tether um, crab pots and lobster pots, again because they're moved north into those waters where there's a lot of activity. But why have they moved north? Well, they've done so because their major prey is, is a small floating crustacean, a planktonic crustacean called Calanus. And Calanus has been moving north at the rate of eight kilometres a year because the waters are warming. It's effectively being driven north by global heating. So you say, ah, right, so this is a climate crisis. It's because of a climate breakdown that the right whale is endangered. You say, well, yes, and... It's also obviously a shipping crisis and it's a fishing crisis, but it's also more than that because while the mortality rate is, is very high, is too high, uh, you would expect under normal conditions the birth rate um, to at least match the current mortality rate, but it's not. Their birth rate has been declining as well. Why is that? Well, a couple of possible reasons are one, marine noise because of the noise created not just by shipping, but also by um, oil and gas exploration. Um, they, they, in seismic surveys, they use noise pulses by military exercises, um, by small boats and jet skis. This appears to create great stress for whales, um, drive, driving them off their feeding grounds or uh, basically creating the sort of anxiety which in any species reduces reproductive success. At the same time, pollutants have been accumulating in their tissues, including endocrine disrupting pollutants, which reduce their fertility. Uh, oh yes, and just to add to all this, um, some fisheries have started up fishing for Calanus, the little crustacean that the whales eat, in order to turn them into fish oil supplements, which some people believe are good for them. It turns out to be completely useless, but um, people are making money from this. So, yeah, let's go and let's go and catch lots of these small crustaceans and turn them into fish oil without any proper environmental impact assessment at all. So what are we looking at here? Well, yeah, we're looking at a shipping crisis, a fishing crisis, a climate crisis, a noise crisis, a pollution crisis. Oh, and back to a fishing crisis. Oh, and incidentally, one more thing, ocean acidification will completely wipe out Calanus and many other plankton if it continues. And that too is caused by um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, mostly from fossil fuel plants, because the, when they dissolve, in seawater they turn to carbonic acid and they make it very hard for marine creatures to form shells. So we're looking at a full spectrum assault on the northern uh, North Atlantic right whale. And, and, and when you put all these things together, you see that, you know, it, you can't divide, divide it up into boxes. This is basic human activity that is driving this whale towards extinction. And the same applies to a very wide range of species and ecosystems. So, for instance, if you look at moths in the UK, and being the nerdy type, I'm particularly interested in moths in, in the UK. Uh, but we all should be because there's massively more species of moths than there are butterflies. They're a really ecologically important group of, of species. Um, and they're being hammered left, right and centre by a huge range of impacts. So if we start with pesticides, now we know that very large amounts of pesticides are sprayed. There have been various 
experiment showing that each of those pesticides is likely to be harmful to moths or to their caterpillars um, and, and to reduce their numbers. There haven't, as far as I can see, yet been any studies showing what happens when you put a cocktail of those pesticides together. Because again, the pesticides don't exist in isolation. Uh, a moth might be exposed to more than one at the same time, um, to several over the course of their lifetime. And what happens when these are used together? Well, as I say, there aren't any studies in moths, but there have been studies in bees, and they show that pesticides can be synergistic in their effects. And what that means is that the effects aren't just added to each other, they are multiplied. And so pesticide A in combination with pesticide B is not A plus B, it's A times B. And it, that cocktail can have devastating impacts. Then, on top of that, we're using other chemicals such as fungicides and herbicides, which also have impacts on moths. But what happens when you put those together with the cocktail of pesticides? Well, we don't know. But again, studies in bees suggest that those two are synergist uh, synergistic. Oh, and then, by the way, we're also using loads of fertilizers. And what fertilizers do is to make some plants, our crop plants, abundant at the expense of other plants, which are very often those which the baby moths, the caterpillars, depend on for their food, or the adult moths depend on for, for the nectar which they drink. Um, and, and so that too is having an effect. Oh, and by the way, fertilisers aren't the only reason for the fertilisation of the land. Um, so much nitrogen is produced by burning fossil fuels, primarily in, in motor vehicles, that in the UK, every hectare of land gets a deposit of five kilograms of nitrogen per year, just, just, from, just from pollution. And that nitrogen also favours certain species of plants, which then grow bigger and bushier and outcompete other species of plants on which certain moth species might be dependent. Bad enough? Well, unfortunately, that's by no means the end of it, because um, uh, as, as global heating changes the seasons, it knocks the moths out of sync with their food plants. The, the plants might flower or come into leaf at the wrong time for the moths, because the moths, th their cycle is set by how things have been historically. And so they, they um, hatch out of their um, pupae, for example, to feed on particular flowers, and those flowers aren't there. They might already have bloomed and died. Or um, the, the caterpillars hatch out of their eggs to feed on the food plant. The food plant's got too big. It's developed too many um, um, secondary chemicals to deter the caterpillars because they basically had to eat the young leaves and they can't eat it anymore. Oh, and on top of that, light pollution turns out to be devastating to moths, particularly the white lights, the white street lights we're now using instead of those orange sodium lights. And white lights are, are more energy efficient. Um, the white LEDs we're using, um, they use less um, um, electricity to power them than the orange sodium lights that we were using before. And so seen entirely from the perspective of climate, you think that's a good thing. But seen from the perspective of the whole, it turns out that that white light, which of course has a much wider spectrum, um, is far more, uh, has a far greater effect on life forms than the orange light. And one study shows that um, caterpillars um, uh, on food plants um, close, to, close to those white lights are far less abundant than caterpillars where there aren't such lights. Light pollution is spreading across the world at great speed. In fact, there are fewer and fewer dark areas, even protected areas around the world. And we don't know what the full impact of that light pollution is. So again, we say, is this a climate crisis? Is this, is this a chemicals crisis? Is, is, is this um, an electricity crisis? What is it that's affecting the moths? It's everything.
The same applies to habitats. So coral reefs, um, they get hammered by overfishing, they get hammered by pollution, they get hammered by bleaching events caused by, by warmer water. And then you get massive cyc cyclones or typhoons come along and smash those coral reefs up. They turn out to be much less resilient to those extreme weather events, which have also been exacerbated by climate chaos, than they would otherwise have been because they've been weakened by the stuff that has already happened to them. Very similar with, with, with the rainforests. Um, if you, they are fragmented um, by, by logging, by cattle ranching, by roads carving, carving through them, if tree diseases are introduced, and unfortunately because of our unbelievable carelessness in this respect, in what's called phytosanitary rules, we, we are allowing the trade in plants to basically wipe out huge numbers of species around the world. It's as if we're, we're introducing every tree species to its deadly pathogen. Um, uh, when, when you stick all that together, um, you, you see a, a system which has become far more vulnerable to the impacts of global heating. And if you look at the Amazon um, rainforest, for example, we see a system in a situation of potentially extreme vulnerability because as the fragmentation proceeds across that, it can break the hydrological cycle. Now, in the Amazon, um, the, the, the forest generates its own rain. And there's been some fascinating work showing it's not just a matter of the trees sucking up water from the ground and releasing it into the air, and that forms clouds. It turns out they also produce specific chemicals that seed clouds. So, so the ecosystem is like working as a whole to create its own rainfall by releasing these quite complex chemicals which have a very powerful effect on cloud seeding. Now, if you cut through those forests and you fragment them sufficiently, they will no longer produce sufficient rain to water themselves and to water the forests generally to, to the um, east of them because that's the way the prevailing winds go. Those die back, die back, you get less and less rainfall, you get less and less forest, less and less rainfall. You can see that vicious spiral beginning to turn. So again, the forests are made less resilient to climate breakdown because of all the other things that are happening to them. And so what we've got to try to do is to see past those boxes, to, to sort of break out of those artificial categories that we've created. Perhaps we shouldn't be having a climate summit at all. Perhaps we shouldn't be having a biodiversity summit. Perhaps we should be having a systemic environmental collapse summit, which seeks to look at the whole picture, which seeks to determine why so many ecosystems all at the same time with such tremendous speed seem to be spiralling towards collapse. And what answer might we receive if we were to ask that question? If we were to say, what am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at systemic environmental collapse across many different ecosystems um, as a result of many different causes. What would we see? We'd see a full spectrum assault on the living world caused by economic activity. That is fundamentally the issue. Now, in, in my previous rant on this programme, um, I talked a little bit about economic activity and how even apparently moderate rates of growth um, can drive an extraordinarily rapid doubling in, in, in that activity. So 3% a year means a doubling every 24 years. And when you look at the full spectrum of what we're doing, you see that it is that is what lies at the heart of it. It's that it's a sheer volume of activity in which human beings are engaged. So it seems to me that if we were to see this holistically, if we were to see the big picture, which as environmentalists we should constantly be trying to do, we would recognise that the fundamental problem is basically us doing too much. Now, some people say, ah, oh, that's because there's too many people. And I hear this 
a lot. You know, always people say, oh, the elephant in the room, there's too many people. But the reality is that actually it's driven above all else by our consumption, our levels of consumption. And that is overwhelmingly concentrated among the richest people on Earth, whose birth rates tend to be quite low, whereas birth rates are highest amongst the poorest people on Earth, whose consumption turns out to be extremely low. And if we want to look at the that total impact of economic activity, we use a formula which is called I equals PAT, which means impact equals population times affluence times technology. But if you are extremely poor, your affluence and your technology are very low. So there's very little A or T with which to multiply that P. So your overall impact is very low. But if you're very rich, as as uh, we are on average in nations such as my own, although, of course, it's woefully mal distributed, that wealth, then you don't need masses masses of people to create a very high impact because you have an awful lot of A and T, affluence and technology, with which to multiply the P, the population. All too often I see concerns about population used as, as a way of deflecting responsibility. People with enormous environmental impacts point to people with much smaller ones and say it's them. They're the problem. It's those people over there breeding too much. Well, actually, a great deal of continued population growth isn't even caused by current fertility rates. It's, it's demographic momentum. Um, it's a simple mathematical function of high fertility rates several generations ago. It's like a storm in the Atlantic, in the middle of the Atlantic, four generations ago, which has generated a wave which is now coming into shore. And so people standing on that shore saying, go back, are like King Canute, um, basically arguing with a mathematical function. Fertility rates have been crashing worldwide. In some countries now, they're way below replacement rate. But in some of those countries, the population is still rising because of that demographic momentum. So in China, for instance, the average um, um, n number of, of, of children per, per per woman is 1.6, which is way below the replacement rate. But China's population is still rising because of stuff which happened many, many years ago, decades ago. If you were to intervene in population at this stage of the curve, it would make more sense to intervene on the issue of longevity, of how long we live. But of course, that would bounce back onto the people trying to deflect blame because you'd say, OK, you want to deal with this? After you. And they wouldn't like that very much. But fundamentally, it's about economic activity. It's about how much each of those who've got money is doing. And that's what's driving the problem. So it seems to me that a fundamental task and a task which I hope would come to the fore if there were what there ought to be, the summit on systemic environmental collapse, is greatly to reduce the economic activity of the richest people on earth. The poorest people, they should raise their economic activity because that extreme poverty is devastating for their well-being. But the richest people, we have a duty to reduce ours. And it's not going to happen just through individual action. I'm not saying that's unimportant. Individual action is important. But much more important is the action that we take collectively. We must combine as citizens to demand something which no generation has ever demanded before. To demand less. Effectively to riot for private, private austerity. That doesn't mean we have to lead poor lives, not at all, because we can have public luxury. And, and that's what I want fundamentally is what I call private sufficiency, public luxury. But spending in the public domain is spending that we can all share. Whereas if we try to spend massively in our private do domains, well, that's spending at the expense of everybody else. And so it's fundamentally that private affluence, the pursuit of private luxury, that if we want to avoid systemic environmental collapse, that's what we need to curtail. So perhaps that's why we're not seeing the bigger picture.
We're not seeing the bigger picture because we don't want to. Thank you.